Uh, allow me to greet you in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. I now understand why God is speaking to us on the issue of prayer. I realize the importance of prayer. That's why God is speaking to us on this topic of prayer. I want you to understand that there is no other way of receiving things from God apart from prayer. Uh, there are things that God does for us without requesting, but most of the things God does for us, uh, he does so in response to prayer, in response to prayer. Um, we can't be saved without prayer because the Bible says those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And calling upon the name of the Lord means praying. We can't be uh, baptized with the Holy Spirit unless we pray. Uh, the Bible says God will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask for him. I can enumerate a number of things which we cannot get without prayer. One person said prayer is the currency of heaven. Currency is a means of exchange. You want something worth 10,000. In order to get that thing, you must pop out 10,000 in exchange for what you want to get. Now, the currency that is used in heaven is prayer. The Bible says, everyone who asks, receives. So the currency of heaven is prayer. In the message, I preach the teaching I, I gave in the last, uh, uh, in the last lesson. I think I concluded by saying the poverty of our lives is the poverty of our prayerlessness. So I'm sensing that God is speaking about prayer in preparation for 2024. I'm sensing very strongly that there are things God wants to do in 2024, which we can receive only through prayer. It's easy for us to speak of a year of exploits, time of exploits. Well, those exploits are achieved through prayer, through prayer. Now, God is then preparing us for next year, 2024, by uh, raising, raising the issue of prayer as a means of receiving things from God. To remind you of what we said last in the first uh, teaching, we said that prayer, we started by defining prayer. Point number one was def definition of prayer. We simply said prayer is an audience with God. When you pray, you pray to God. You pray to him. He says, go into your closet talk to God who hears someone who prays in the closet and he will answer you. So prayer is talking to God in your closet. That's important for us to know that when we are praying, we have an audience with God. It would be good for us not to waste that audience. An audience with a big person is a, it's a privilege. It is a privilege that must not be wasted. It must not be wasted. We said prayer is conversing. 
you say something to God and God says something back to you. It's a conversation. And what is important when you talk about conversation is the issue of a two-way two -way communication. We call it a dialogue. It's not a one-way communication, a monologue. We talk to God and God talks back to us. We said prayer is a conversation, a two-way communication between the one praying and God to whom the person is praying. Then number three was that prayer is a communion and the idea of communion uh, emphasizes the issue of relationship, the issue of fellowship. When you pray, you are fellowshipping with God. That's why sometimes when you pray, you can pray without asking for anything. Uh, eulogizing God, worshiping Him, praising Him for who He is, and um, God uh, talking to you, instructing you, that's prayer. It's, it's, it's a relationship. It's a time of relating with God. A time of communing with God. So it is an audience with God. It's a conversation with God. It is a time of communion with God. Now, the last time then we... Uh, talked, we also dealt with the secret of effectiveness in prayer. We read a scripture that says prayer is powerful and effective. The prayer of uh, the righteous or the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. James 5 I think it's verse 16. Now, we mentioned three important things which makes prayer very effective. And those things are outside of us, all three of them. We'll be talking today about things that concern us. But first and foremost, uh, the effectiveness of prayer does not lie with us primarily. It lies with God. One, we said, uh, what makes prayer effective is the God to whom we pray. The God to whom we pray. Uh, the Bible says in Matthew 6, 6 to 8, when we pray, Say, our Father, who art in heaven. So Christ was teaching us that we direct our prayer to God the Father. Is it wrong to pray to God the Son? No, it is not, because God the Son is God. Is it wrong to pray to God the Holy Spirit? No, it is not wrong, because God the Holy Spirit is God. It's not wrong at all. But primarily, prayer is directed to God. Christ taught us to address our prayers to God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, um, when we talk to God, there are many things we should know about him to realize that our prayers will be effective. Number one, we should know that God is omniscient, means he knows everything. So there's a scripture that says in Isaiah, before we open our mouth, he already knows. Before we utter uh, the word of prayer, God is already answering us. It's wonderful to talk to someone who knows what you need. 
or knows your concerns. You don't have to explain much. He understands. If you are sick, he knows the cause, the cause of your sickness. He knows the extent of your sickness. He knows. We pray to God who knows. But God is also omnipotent. We pray to God who knows. I mean, who does not only know, but God who is all-powerful. So when we pray to a God who is all-powerful, um, there is nothing he can do. There is nothing that is beyond his power. Uh, we pray to a God who is omnipresent, uh, a God who is present where we're praying, and when our children are praying elsewhere, God is present there. So we're not talking to an absent God, we're talking to a present God. That makes our prayer very effective when we pray to a person like God. We know that God is loving. We know that when we talk to him, we are not talking to someone who is indifferent to our prayer, but uh, someone who is well disposed, favorably disposed to us as we pray, because he is a God who is loving. So all the attributes of God, the attribute of kindness, the attribute of compassion, they give, they give us rest when we talk to this kind of God. So prayer is effective then because of who we are praying to. Then prayer is also effective because of who we are praying through. Uh, in John 14, verse 13, he says, if we ask anything in his name, it will be done. Note in his name. We pray in his name. John uh, 16, 23, 24 also emphasizes the effect of praying in his name. That's very critical. We are praying in his name. That is very important. Now, what is the importance of that? It is important because God has credibility. I mean, Christ has credibility with the Father. So if we go to the Father and say, we are coming to make our request in the name of your Son, whom you love, uh, the one who pleases you, uh, we are coming in his name, we are coming in his credibility. Um, we are not coming in our own credibility. We are not coming in our own righteousness. We are coming in his own righteousness. We are not coming in our own holiness, we are coming in his own, own holiness. We are praying in his name. Lord, open the gate, uh, open your ears to our prayer because of who we are praying through. That's what makes prayer effective. If you pray in the name of Baal, or you pray in the name of your dead ancestor, you pray in the name of the Pope, you pray in the name of the man of God. All those people don't have the credibility that Christ has with the Father. So the effectiveness of prayer is, is, the, is the name of Christ. We're praying in the name of Christ. And then number three, we said that prayer is effective because of who helps us in our prayers. Romans 8, 26 says we're weak. We don't know what to ask for, and we don't know how to ask. But the Holy Spirit helps us in our prayers. That is why the Bible says in Ephesians 6, verse 18, pray in the Spirit. What does it mean to pray in the Spirit? It means 
we must be guided by God in your prayers. Those are the two points we dealt with in our first lesson. Uh, the definition of prayer, and then number two, the effectiveness of prayer. The effectiveness of prayer is contingent on three things. The one to whom we pray, the one through whom we pray, and the one who helps us in our prayer. The triune God is interested in our prayers. Now, in this second teaching on prayer, we'll be focusing on us. That's all we'll be talk talking about in this second lesson on prayer. Um, the question we want to ask is, what makes our prayer effective from our, our side? Uh, what makes prayer effective from our side? We want to mention nine things. If the Lord gives me the tenth, tenth thing, I will also mention it. Nine things that will make your prayer effective. I think you would be interested in that. What must you do for your prayer to be effective? There are nine things we must do. And if you do the combination of these nine things, your prayer will be powerful and your prayer will be effective. The first thing is faith. When you pray without faith, you are like someone whistling in the, in the wind. You are wasting your time because God is not interested in someone who's asking what he or she does not believe. Uh, she, he or she will get it. Uh, God is not interested. If you pray to him and you don't believe him, God will be not interested. Matthew 22 stresses the issue of faith. It uses the word belief, belief, belief. And the word belief is used, I think, three times. Matthew 11, no, not Matthew, Mark. Please pardon me, Mark 11, verses 22 to 24. Uh, this verse says, in 22, have faith in God. You remember we said that our prayers are directed to God. When you direct your prayers to God, have faith in him. Have faith that he will listen to you. Have faith that he will listen to you with interest. Have faith that he will listen to you with patience with understanding, uh, he will lovingly listen to you. Uh, have faith in God. It begins there. And he says, I tell you the truth, if anyone says to this mountain, don't think of a physical mountain like Mount Kilimanjaro, Mount Kenya, no. Uh, a mountain is an obstruction. A mountain stands for an obstruction. When you say something is a big mountain, I've got a big mountain to climb in order to get this job. You're saying that I'm, I'm having a lot of challenges, uh, difficulties, impediments uh, that will hinder me from getting what I want to get. Now it says, and I tell you the truth, if anyone says to this hindrance, to this seemingly insurmountable problem, to this mountain, we say to it, go throw yourself into the sea. You say to the problem, disappear. Throw yourself into the sea. 
and does not doubt it in his heart. Does not doubt it in his heart, but believes. You are facing a big problem, a problem that seems that seems to be insurmountable, a huge problem. You simply say to the problem, solve yourself, throw yourself into the sea. And you believe that what you say will happen. What have you said? Throw yourself into the sea. That's what you say. And you believe that when you say, throw yourself into the sea, that will happen. You say to the big problem, disappear. Uh, be drowned in the sea. He says, it will be done for him. It will be done for him. So faith is important. Then verse 24 says, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it. Believe that you have received it. And it will be yours. Believe that you have received it and it will be yours. So number one then, if you want your prayer to be effective, you must have faith. You are praying to God who is omniscient, God is omnipotent, God is omnipresent. God who knows everything, God is who is all-powerful, and God who is present everywhere. Praying to that God. Belief. Faith. Number two, what you need in order to approach God is personal cl cleansing. Personal clean cleanliness. Cleanliness. Holiness. Righteous. The Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, God would not have had me. Or another version says, if I cherished wickedness in my heart, God would not have had me. So when you pray, you must not have wickedness in your heart. Proverbs 15 and verse 8. Let's look at it. Proverbs 15 and verse 8. And hear what it says about the issue of righteousness and prayer. 15 and verse 8. The Bible says, The Lord detests, the word detests, means hates the sacrifice of the wicked. But the prayer of the upright pleases him. When your life is clean before God and you pray to him, he's pleased with your prayer. When you see people whose prayers are answered, you are seeing someone with whom God is pleased. Uh, the fact that the prayers are answered is the proof that God is pleased to that person. That is 15 verse 8. Uh, sometimes someone who has got access to God is abused. When you pray and God answers, and people know that God answers your prayers, they will all flock to you, asking you to pray for them, exploiting the fact that God is pleased with you. Verse 29. Still Proverbs 15, 29. Proverbs 15 and verse 29. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. He hears the prayer of the righteous. James 5, verse 16. Uh, the last part of verse 16. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So make sure that your life is clean, your, your life is right with God. And when you pray, God will listen to you and he will help you. So the second secret of getting answers from God, uh, the secret of, of your prayers penetrating to God, one is faith, Number two is a life of righteousness. Number three, the Bible says, 
God hears the prayers of people who is sensitive to the needs of the poor. Sensitive to the needs of the poor. When you help the poor out of a pure heart, out of a compassionate heart, God sees it. And God uh, will listen to your prayers. Proverbs 21 and verse 13. Proverbs 21 verse 13. If a man shuts his ears to the cry of the poor, he too will cry out and not be answered. The implication is that if you shut your ears to the cry of the poor, God will also shut uh, his ears to your prayers. So if you want God to hear your prayers, you must be generous to the poor. You must be sensitive to the poor. Uh, when we read in Acts chapter 10, we find a man who was generous to the poor and God heard his prayer. Uh, it says, I'm reading from verse um, from verse 1, from verse 1, it says, At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius. He was a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. That's verse 1. Verse 2, he and his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need. Mark that. He, he gave generously to those in need. And prayed to God. Prayed to the right person regularly. He was a prayerful person. Now one day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius, and Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel said, your prayers and your gifts. He was generous. He gave generous to the poor. Your prayers and your gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now, when you pray to, when you give to the poor, God will give to you Compa compassion towards the poor will make a God to be favorably disposed towards you. That's important. In uh, Isaiah 58, Isaiah 58 deals with the issue of uh, uh, fasting. And God is asking the question, what kind of us, what kind of fasting do I need? And then Isaiah answers that the kind of fasting that God need, that God uh, pays attention to. Um, it says that God, God's fasting is not abstaining from food, abstaining from water. It is not that, really. <clears throat> it says in verse 6 of Isaiah 58, is not this the kind of fasting I've chosen? Is this not the kind of fasting I've chosen to loose the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of yoke, to set the oppressed free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry? Is it not to provide the poor wanderer with a shelter? 
And when you see the naked to clothe him and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood, then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you'll call and the Lord will answer. Then you'll call and the Lord will answer when you are sensitive to the needs of the poor. That's number three. Number four uh, is when you ask with right motives. The effectiveness of prayer is not asking. The effectiveness of prayer is asking with right motives. Uh, we get James <clears throat> uh, chapter 4, verse 2 says, if I could read it in the King James Version, it says, ye ask and receive not, because you ask, no, 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 verse 2, uh, Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot have, cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye, ye ask not. You don't have because you don't ask. <clears throat> but verse 3 then says something that important. It says, when you ask, you do not receive. And the Bible says, everyone who asks, asks receives. But this one says, when you ask, you do not receive. Because you ask with wrong motives. Wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on your pleasures. What are the examples of wrong motives? You have a car that is strong. It's still really working very well and it is adequate for your needs, then you see your friend or your relative buying a new car. And all of a sudden, you ask God to give you a new car. Not because you need a car, but your motive is to uh, compete with your friend, with your family member. The motive is wrong. I would give you many other examples. Uh, you want to get married and you've seen a sister or a brother and you want to get married to that person and you pray fervently that God would soften the heart of the person you want to get married to, but the motive is wrong. You want this sister because she looks pretty and you are driven by lust. Or you want this brother because the brother is wealthy and you want to get married to his wealth rather than getting married to the person, the motive. So you don't get it because you, right, you ask with wrong motives. Number five, you don't get because you don't keep God's word. When God speaks to you and says something to you, you don't keep his word. And therefore God does not answer your prayers because you don't keep his word. We'll find that in Proverbs 28, Proverbs 28 and verse nine, the issue of keeping his word. He says your pro the prayers of a person who ignores the law are despised. The law, the law, the phrase law and prophets refers to the Old Testament. Sometimes the entirety of the Old Testament is referred to as the law. So verse 9 says, the prayers of a person who ignores the law are despised. When you pray to God and you don't intend 
to do his will, to listen to his word, he will not answer you. He will not answer you. So the issue of being uh, committed to his word. Sometimes you pray and he will tell you what to do. And if you do what he tells you what to do, then God will listen to you. Uh, in Zechariah uh, chapter 7 also alludes to this. Uh, Zechariah uh, chapter 11. It says something about it. Uh, Zechariah chapter 11. It says uh, in verses 11 to <clears throat> 13, that was the end of my covenant with them, referring to the Jews. Those who bought and sold sheep were watching me. And they knew that the Lord was speaking to them through my actions. God was speaking to them through me, through my actions. And I said to them, if you if you like, give me my wages, whatever I am worth, but only if you want to. So they counted me out for my wages, 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, throw, throw it to the, to the porters, this magnificent sum at which they valued me. So I took the 30 coins, threw them to the porters in the temple of the Lord. But at verse 11, it talks about us not listening to his word. But verse 11, if we don't listen to his word, if we don't listen to I told them, he says, it was revoked on that day. And so the afflicted of the flock who were watching me knew it was the word of the Lord. I told them. But they despised the word of the Lord and their prayers were not answered. And then number five is abiding in Christ. That's number six, abiding in Christ. If you are born again, you are a child of God, remain born again. Um, you remain in Christ. You remain saved. You remain born again. Sin will separate you from Christ. But when you stay away from sin, you will remain in Christ. And his word must also remain in you. When you do that, your prayers will be answered. Get this in John chapter 15 and verse 7. Uh, if you remain in me, Christ says, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish. It will be given to you. Ask whatever you wish. It will be given. The condition is remaining in Christ and his word remaining in you. Then number seven, you must pray with expectation. Goes back to the issue of faith. When you pray, you must pray with expectation. And when you do so, God will listen to your prayers. He will uh, answer your prayers. You get this in Psalm 5. Verse 3, Psalm 5, verse 3, it says, In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you and wait in expectation, underline that, and wait in expectation. The New Living Bible says, Listen to my voice in the morning. Each morning I bring my request to you and wait expectantly. 
expectantly. That means faith. God will hear you. And number eight, you must be praying according to the will of God. And the Holy Spirit is there now to assist you when you pray to reveal to you what is contrary to God's will and what accords with God's will. First uh, John chapter 5 verses 14 and 15, they say in verse 14, uh, and we, we can be confident that he will listen to us when we ask him for anything in line with his will. We are confident that he will listen to us when we ask for anything in line with his will. And if we know he is listening when we make our request, we can be sure that he will give us what we ask for. This is dependent on whether what you're asking for accords with his will or not. And then the last uh, secret of effective prayer is to obey his commands. Whatever he tells you, you do it. You are an obedient child of God. And then God will do what you're asking for. We also do things for the children who obey us. If you're an obedient child of God, then God will listen to you. First John chapter 3 and verse 22. First John chapter 3 and verse 22, the Bible says, and receive from him anything we ask. And he says, let me start from verse 21. It says, dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And we receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands. And we do what pleases him, two things. We obey his commands, and we do what pleases him. When we do that, God will answer our prayers. God wants to answer our prayers next year. And he's giving us a clue as to what, how to pray in order, for, in order for our prayers to be answered. One, we must pray in faith. Number two, we must pray in righteousness. Number three, we must be sen sensitive to the needs of the poor and meeting them. Number four, we must ask with right motives. Number five, we must keep his word. And the written word of God and the spoken word uh, to us. Number six, we must abide in Christ and his word must abide in us. Number seven, we must pray with expect, expectation, with a sense of expectancy. Number eight, we must pray according to the will of God. And number nine, we should be obedient children of God. And when we're obedient, God will listen to our prayers. I'm praying that uh, this prepares you for 2024 because God intends to answer, to do great and mighty things next year, provided we are prayerful. God is really dealing with the issue of prayer because he's encouraging us to pray. Our Father, we thank you for this word. Amplify it in our hearts. Give us the, the desire to Put your word into practice and see what God will do for us. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. The Lord bless you. We are preparing for 2024. The Lord be with you and bless you. Bye-bye for now.